Well, welcome everybody to the Audit and Risk Committee uh, meeting for the Maratu District Council for the Friday the 18th of February. Um, I'll declare the meeting open and ask for apologies. We do have a couple of councillors missing at this point. Um, do we want to record them as an apology or not? They haven't put one in, so well, perhaps we won't. Um, Right, I'll move on to item three, uh, confirmation of minutes. Uh, the minutes are in the paper. Uh, somebody like to move that they um, are true and correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to so move. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, can I call for a second, please? Thank you, Councillor Hadfield. Um, put the motion, all those in favour. Raise your hand. Thank you. Against, that's carried. All good. Um, Steph, would you mind just clicking that got it um, screen away from the middle of my screen? The meeting is being recorded. Do I have to, or do I have to um, get rid of that? Yes, I you do. need to accept that. Thank you. Thank you. Done. Item four, declarations of interest. Does any member have an uh, interest they need to declare in relation to any item on the agenda? All good, thank you. Uh, item five, notification of late items. I'm not aware of any. Uh, item six, there's no presentations. Move to item seven, officer reports. 7.1, safety and wellbeing quarterly report. Uh, report of the general manager, people, people and culture. So Francis, I'll pass to you, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, councillors. Um, the reason why this looks a bit different uh, this month and is not part of the normal quarterly report is that we've been working on streamlining our reporting. Usually at the first item for order and risk would be our deep dive, uh, but you'll recall that this month, thanks to COVID and our two-team approach, we thought it pragmatic to postpone. Um, so we were going to have a look at roading and we intend to do that next um, next audit and risk meeting. So the idea of bringing the um, health and safety reporting into its own report at the beginning is that it will flow nicely on from the deep dive. Um, so, so that's the purpose of doing it slightly differently uh, this time. Um, you'll see the normal quarterly reports there. Uh, in terms of health and safety in the organisation, COVID is... Um, the, the big news, really, we continue to manage uh, to try to balance the government's expectations uh, and all the rules, along with being in the red setting, keeping our people safe, um, but also recognising what's actually happening out there in the community, which until very recently has actually been very few COVID cases. On the positive news side, we received our batch of rapid antigen tests last week. So we went in with a bulk order um, with the neighbouring councils and ended up with 7,000 rat tests. So um, Brooke has quite an impressive photo of them all lined up on, on the committee room tables. Um, the other councils have now all collected theirs. What that means is that we were able to kick off our um, rapid antigen testing with our staff who have chosen not to be vaccinated from Monday. Uh, that was Monday earlier this week, and that is all going very smoothly. Um, we are very happy with our process, um, as are the, those staff who are undertaking those tests. In the next couple of weeks, we will also be uh, looking at what's called surveillance testing. So that is for staff who are vaccinated, but who are undertaking high-risk roles, in particular those out and about in the community, interacting with people who may or may not be vaccinated. Um, and so we will be stepping up surveillance testing using our rapid antigen tests to keep an eye on um, whether any of our vaccinated staff um, do pick up COVID. Um, the two teams approach, which we are continuing to work, um, is largely being successful, though some teams are finding it more difficult than others. So in particular for our compliance teams, the, the two teams approach does have a real impact on productivity. And so Lynn um, and others, Kathy and Hamish, are working really closely with those teams to see what we can do, to set up separate working areas so they're not interacting with the rest of the staff from the opposite team, but that they we provide spaces for them to continue to deliver services to the community. 
So I think those those are the main things to report. Very happy to take questions. I like your comment about um, focusing on productivity. Uh, I think it's pretty critical that we do our very very best to um, you know maintain those standards um, of of customer service that you know that that people expect. So yeah, please. Um, we'd, I'd encourage you to continue with those efforts. Make sure that. Um, everybody's got the support networks around them to um, you know be able to do the job the best they can mm. there's nothing worse for uh, I think you know from an employee's point of view of struggling uh, not knowing who to ask or mm. who, where to go for help um, you know if they've got, a, got an issue and it's it's pretty difficult if you're used to just running around down the hallway to, mm. to someone who can't do that so mm. yeah yep. um, keep working on that Francis thank you any other questions? Um, Councillor Short. Francis, just thinking of everyone working from home at the moment and um, keeping staff feeling connected to their workplace and their workmates. Did I read in there somewhere there hadn't been a um, staff newsletter for some time? And I was wondering whether that was being reviewed. And um, just wanted to commend the initiatives for some of the things that you are doing, like the, the Zoom quiz the other day. I'm sure those that joined it uh, enjoyed themselves. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Short. So yes, in um, response to the newsletter, um, that has been replaced by uh, a fortnightly email from the Chief Executive. So um, what we're trying to do is every fortnight we have an all staff Zoom meeting and a sort of more serious one about updates about COVID and what's happening around the business. And then in the week that we don't have an all staff Zoom meeting, we have the email that comes out from Shane, which Kathy and her comms team um, work on. And it's that fortnightly email, which has to some degree repla replaced the staff newsletter. Um, we have made it, and Kathy, please jump in if you'd like to comment. We are um, in the very latest stages of appointing a communications and engagement manager. And our expectation is that that person will look very closely at the comms that we are doing both internally and externally. And we want to make a real um, step change in the work that we're doing in that space. Thank you. Right. Um, John. Yeah, so just um, a comment first. Um, I do a, um, a JP clinic at the library on a periodic basis and I have to commend the library staff for the way that they're dealing with people coming in and out and assisting them. Um, and then just, just a question. I just noticed in the report that um, we're undertaking body composition scans. Could, could, Francis, could you tell me what that entails? Um, so it's kind of like a very fancy set of scales that you step on and it scans your whole body and gives you a worryingly accurate um, reflection about your body composition, your uh, fat content, your muscle content. It gives you your biological age, which might be higher or lower than your actual age. So we've probably got around 20 or 30 staff, and not the same staff do it every time, different staff who participate at different times throughout the year. And then the lady who does it, um, Fiona, her name is, um, from Elevate Wellness, then works with those staff around a, a health plan, basically, <coughs> for how you can improve your figures. I'm presuming that that's optional because of privacy concerns. And, and also that that is not going to become compulsory for us. <laughs> no, no, it's optional and the staff contribute to the cost. So council pays half and a staff member pays half and the results are completely private. Although I do have to say on the days that Fiona does it, many staff are walking around with their printouts, comparing notes and um, laughing about how old or young they are. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your support. Good as go. Uh, you got it all. I take yep, it. Yep, excellent. Uh, thank, on, thanks, Phil. You better mute. <laughs> right. Um, just uh, yes, comment. Stuart, if I may. Uh, yes, Grant. Um, Francis, a couple of things uh, with the rapid antigen test. So we're going to we're going to keep data on um, uh, on those uh, that are testing whether they're uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic. Uh, one one question. Uh, second question: um, Is the council going to uh, you know, just blithely follow the uh, government's uh, plan around um, a, a movement out of um, you know mandate measures, or do we have a plan of our own? Uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, thirdly, 
Uh, I'll leave it at two at the moment. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So rapid antigen tests are only for asymptomatic people. Anybody who has symptoms uh, must not be at work, must be at home. Uh, and the advice is that they should ring Healthline and um, determine whether they need a PCR test. So, so, so if I may, Francis, for, for those staff that are, are not vaccinated, that I understand will be um, undertaking reasonably regular uh, um, rat tests. Um, that's probably where the question was more uh, directed. So, you know, people that are taking them because they're not vaccinated, are we going to keep a track on whether those people, if they test up positive, whether they're um, symptomatic or asymptomatic? Absolutely. So Thanks, the, the frequency for the um, rat testing under red, so this is for unvaccinated staff, under red is every day that they are in the office interacting with other staff or interacting with members of the public. Yeah. Under orange, it's twice a week, and under green, it's once a week. So it's based on the government's traffic light settings. Um, and yes, every day we've got a, a rotor in the PNC team. We keep a track of who we are expecting of our non vaccinated staff in the office. We record the results of their um, rapid antigen tests. We've only ever had negative. If they did have a positive, then they would not be coming into work. They would be calling Healthline and going for their PCR test. They would also need to follow our. Um, our, it's called the locations of interest policy, but it's actually for anybody who is a close contact or a casual contact or in fact tests positive for COVID, they then need to follow that process. So that's informing their manager, um, who then escalates it to the GM and the people and culture team. And then we would work carefully with them and their families around isolating, getting the proper tests, et cetera. And then working through any of their um, close contacts, any of the staff that have been working with them, who might also need to isolate and start testing. So probably my third uh, question was, is, is there any plan uh, at any stage to, to move uh, council meetings back into um, um, into the chamber, um, given that we've done that in the past in level three or when we, however it was. Um, my view is, is that actually the, I, I found a meeting yesterday on Zoom, 8.30 to 3.30, extraordinarily difficult. Um, the audio coming out of the council chamber sounds like a whale in a fish pond at times. You know, so it, it is actually quite difficult. And uh, I'm wondering whether or not um, uh, any thoughts been given to actually the necessity for uh, elected members to, to be split up? I might let Shane answer that one. <laughs> um, we haven't, well, the Mayor and I haven't had a discussion about reviewing that. I'm quite happy to, but, um, you know, it's um, something that we're doing as staff to keep the two teams apart so that we lessen potentially the impact on the organisation if this virus gets into the community. Um, one of our key functions is to keep our governance function going um, and it would be difficult if you were all down. Um, so our way of trying to manage that is the two teams approach. Um, but happy to have that conversation with, with you if that's what, what you, everybody thinks. And I fully accept um, how difficult it is to work on the other end of a Zoom. Um, I'll be doing that all next week and it is very trying, I, I have to say. Yeah, uh, Lynn. Um, I think it, you know, staff are finding it difficult, as we, as Francis mentioned at the beginning. Um, so, or some staff are finding it difficult to work in two teams. So, I think if we made a different decision for elected members, that wouldn't be as as leaders of the organisation. I don't think that would be a good message, personally, for staff who are required to um, work in two teams. That's just my opinion. Just to add my two bob, two cents worth in. Yeah. Yeah, I think we probably do need a bit of consistency. So, anybody else got any comment on COVID? Um, John? If I just make a comment on technology, last time I zoomed into one of these meetings that was being held in the chamber, it was extraordinarily difficult to hear what was going on. 
So I think there might be a tech issue that could perhaps be investigated there. Um, we have got we have got microphones on order, um, uh, and they're on the way. Um, yeah, and understand the supply. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, questions regarding COVID? Yeah, Stuart, just just me here. Um, yes. And apologies for my lateness this morning. Had a physio appointment, um, but as you can see at, at the college today. Um, yeah, it is very difficult. I can fully understand the comments just previously around the difficulties that we're all facing. Um, yeah, we have to be masked up the whole time while we're here at college. Um, and obviously under the education system, there's still uncertainty around rep tests and all those sorts of things. So um, fully understand where the workers and, and the management are at with council and um, anything that we can do just to ease that um, would be great, really, um, but there's not much we can do other than, than boxing on with the best we can. Yes. Councillor Short? Um, I just wondered, uh, Francis, whether customer behaviour had settled down now that we're well into the vaccine pass uh, era. At the beginning, I know there was a lot of people that were frustrated and um, uncooperative. Has that improved? I'll let Lynn and Kathy um, jump in here, but um, when I talked to the front of house ladies earlier this week, they did say that this week uh, had been better than the previous week. I think it has taken a really long time to, um, to settle down. Uh, I think the, Kathy's nodding, my impressions from the library and the pool are that largely um, that has settled down, though we probably have a small handful of a very vocal minority who continue to be deeply unhappy with council. Thank you. Um, question arises from that, uh, Mr. Harris, if you've given any thought to um, the risk of a, a, a protest uh, locally, if we, if, we, if we had a protest the Nara Two District Council, how would we handle that? Haven't, haven't you driven past the police station this week, Stuart? It's already here. All <laughs> oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, well, we thought we were getting one yesterday, but it wasn't about COVID. <laughs> yeah, well, they uh, seem to be ramping up in different parts of the country, so I guess it's a risk that it could happen here. So yeah, just something to keep in mind. We might go to Mount Lees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anything else on COVID? No. All right. If I go, just go back to the report, uh, just to comment. I'm encouraged to see the um, layout of the report um, with uh, events reporting the trend um, with a little bar graph there on page 12. Um, so, yeah, yeah that, that's, I think, a quite a useful tool to see the trend going either up or down, and it generally tends to be going down this year. So, that's good. Um, and especially everything is down this quarter. So positive signs, Francis? I think so. I think um, Brooke Rush is doing a particularly good job um, and he, he has a lot of credibility in the organisation and is well liked, so that's making a difference. Very good. All right. Um, any other comments on the report? If not, with us a recommendation on page um, 10. Would somebody like to move that, please? Councillor Marsh. Um, I'll take it that you've uh, moved that motion. The audit and risk received the safety and wellbeing report for quarter two. Somebody like to second it? Uh, Councillor Short, thank you. Put the motion, all those in favour? Um, against? Carried, thank you. Right. Sorry, Stuart, I haven't got enough screens to have everything up. And... <laughs> That's fine. Okay, moving on then, item 7.2, the quarterly performance report to 31 December, a report of the Chief Financial Officer. Um, Amanda, we'll pass to you. Morning. Um, so yes, quarterly report to um, December, which is really a six monthly report, halfway through the financial year. Um, that's pretty exciting, actually. It means we're getting through a fair chunk of our work. Um, the financial results is outlined in the report. We are um, showing a surplus of 6.3 million against a budgeted surplus of 3.8. Um, some major drivers in that, um, revenue is, you know, it's 680 odd thousand dollars ahead of target. And it's actually not a lot, um, not for a large um, organization like us. 
of that 422 of it is due to the gain on sale from Bowen Street. So that's, that's in essence, it's a book item. Um, it's recognising the gain that we have once we go through the process of disposing of the asset. So although we received a lot more than 422,000, I think it was 1.9, um, by the time we write down the value of it and we recognise the gains that we've had during its life cycle through the revaluation, we end up having a book gain on sale. Um, it's not cash that we can go and spend because we have actually spent that cash that we received for Bowen Street to pay the debt that was associated with it. So it's very much a book item. Um, the other thing is that we're slightly ahead in revenue in Ohakia, Rural Water Scheme. Again, that's, that's just a timing issue. Um, it's, we've invoiced slightly sooner than we expected to when we did the budget, but saying that we've invoiced in regards to when we needed to to do with the contract. So it's more about the fact that we probably had the phasing of the budget a little bit out of skew with the actual contracts. Um, development contributions, I quietly am quite pleased with these because we're not having a big variance between budget and actuals, which we've seen in previous years. So it makes us think that that's a really good thing. However, it would be a much better thing if we were ahead of budget because in previous years, as you recall, we've been behind. So we are loan funding a lot of our growth works because the DCs haven't come in as fast as we actually need them. So although it looks good on paper, the, in reality, um, it's not that flash. Um, expenditure. Now, the expenditure for staffing looks pretty close. It's only $200,000 variance. But bear in mind that we're at December. So what happens with that is um, we've incurred all our, all our costs and in January is actually when all our leave um, predominantly occurs. You know, 1st of January onwards, you have quite a lot of annual leave. And that's when our personnel costs drop. So at the end of January, the um, variance in staff costs is a lot bigger. Um, and it's then you can clearly see the vacancies that we are carrying or have carried. Some of the more significant ones being the GMs um, and regulatory, we've got the planning. I mean, you'll be well aware of where our kind of vacancies are sitting. Um, depreciation, I'm also really excited about that because it's really close to budget. And previously we've had some quite large gaps in there. Um, the revaluation um, for infrastructure would normally have been brought in much, much earlier, but due to audit being so late, we've held that off. And although the work's been done, we haven't recognised that until we're actually doing it in um, February, mm -hmm. just um, because if audit had come across with any changes that they required in the assets, it would have been really hard to have unpicked the revaluation to do the audit change. So we just delayed bringing that um, revaluation in. But when we compare the information that we have for the revaluation compared to our budget, um, we are pretty close to budget. So I'm really, really pleased that we've actually done some really good budgeting in that area. Um, operating expenditure is our big chunky bit. You're sitting around 1.5 mil underspent at this stage, and there's some pretty chunky project stuff in there. Um, a lot around maintenance in the community areas, um, some wastewater and solid waste, I think it is, um, a bit behind, and district development. So we're currently completing forecasts and um, asking managers to really forecast where they're at. At the moment, no one's really come back and said, I'm going to finish up with a lot of leftover unspent money, um, but some of those discussions are still happening. Capital spend is our next biggie. Um, we've spent 19.2 mil against a budget of 30.4, so that's 37%. We're halfway through the year, so you think, gosh, that's not great. But if you take into consideration the purchase orders that are already there, so we've already done a lot of the tendering and done a lot of the contracting, um, we're actually sitting at 32.9. So we've, we have committed a fair chunk of that work to be done. Um, you'll notice that we've um, changed the level of service reporting and on the request of Councillor Hillary a couple of meetings ago, um, the discussion was it's really lovely to present a quarterly result, but it's not very informative if you can't compare it to how it was previously, have we got better or worse? So the format that you have there is modelled along the annual report format where it shows you your results from the previous year alongside the total result for this year. We've brought in last year, last quarter and this quarter. 
Um, just be careful if the measure has changed. It, there's a little section there that says measure for last year was this and the measure for this year is this, because sometimes we do change those measures across budgets. Um, happy to take questions, which I'll probably direct to various people. Sure, right. Um, perhaps we'll just take questions on any part of the report. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, on page 22, uh, community facilities, um, I noticed that the, the pool, quite a, uh, Mark, you know, is um, well down on uh, revenue. Uh, I guess it's all, all COVID related. We could we could blame blame that. Um, interesting thing though, the, the library is up. So I just wondered why one was down so much and the other wasn't, because I would have thought they were both affected the same way. So then you might want to answer that, or I can step um, the, the, Obviously, the pool is um, impacted by COVID. The swim school. Uh, revenue that they normally get in they've just not been able to hold those programs and um, so that's really impacted the um, pools revenue coming in and um, from the library yeah. um, I can't remember Amanda what was can you okay, what the, so library, the was? library they have additional funding for two positions um, I think that's part from position from the yep. National Library something or other. So we have we have funding for two extra people. So you'll also see the staff costs are up um, and also the, the revenues up. So the net effect is nothing. At the end of year, they're fully funded positions. And, okay. and thanks, Amanda. And those um, staff have been directed to have, were really involved in helping people um, get their vaccination certificates and you know, have them on their phone or getting hard copies, etc. They've been doing a lot of that information centre type activity, which has been good. Okay, thank you. Um, page twenty three, um, building control hmm. under regulatory big excess there, and um, uh, more money in than than we were expecting. What what's the uh, what was the story with that one? Um, you've got a note there, favourable to budget, uh, higher than anticipated request for building consents. Um, if that was the case, though, I would have thought the expenditure would have matched the um, um, income, but it uh, doesn't appear to be the case. Um, Kathy, are you able to help us there? It, it's probably a me thing again. Oh, right. um, <laughs> it, it is, um, you know, I understand that some of that is about timing. I mean, it does show that. Um, growth that we're having in the district and but my understanding and Amanda correct me if I'm wrong some of this is about timing right so there may be some more costs to come you're saying we'll just check with Amanda who who the, there's, has, a yeah, there's a combination of things the additional revenue is due to additional volume so that that's a great big tick because you get additional volumes we're getting growth so that, that's fabulous um, of course, with additional volumes becomes additional resourcing requirements. So you have the impact of us having to outsource um, or get additional staffing. So your costs are up. The costs are not as high as um, the revenue is higher. You know, so we've got a variance of 113,000 in expenditure being over and we're over in revenue by 200,000. There is a slight buffer in there. Bear in mind that our charging does have a component of overhead allocation in there. So there is a little bit of a buffer in there, but also some of the costs associated with building um, sit within various areas and it relies on the timesheets to be absolutely accurate and that they've charged the right place. And it also relies on um, the timing of the invoices. So what we've done is we've looked across now and said, these consents, applications, whatever it is that we're looking at, are in progress and we know that they're going to be invoiced so we're accruing for the revenue. Some of that accrual may be a little bit too high because actually they might not be going to charge that fully. So there is a little bit of a um, an estimate in there, I suppose, when you're doing an accrual is you'll know, Stuart, it's your best um, guess at that point in time based on the volumes that you have. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll carry on. Uh, page 24, um, the standard water supply, um, yeah, Excuse me, Stuart. Yeah. Sorry, um, Chair. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if we could, um, if we're going through the um, 
through the thing if we could actually, um, you know, uh, all have the opportunity to direct questions around a specific so either um, yep. community facilities or regulatory or whatever, sure. rather than going backwards and forwards. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, um... and, and I do note that Councillor Casey's had a stand up for a bit. Oh, apologies. I, didn't, I missed that. Um, we'll, we'll go back over those two pages we've just covered then. Um, Grant, have you, have you got any questions on either of those? Uh, yes, I did, um, Mr Chair, but uh, Councillor Casey's been very patiently waiting with his, uh, with his mitt up in the air. <laughs> sure. Um, Councillor Casey. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Look, it's just a very quickly, it's apology for lateness. I had uh, dropped the meeting off my calendar, my bad, so it's just a very quick apology. Thank you for taking the time to just to pause for that. That's uh, all right. Um, yeah, yeah Councillor thank, Hayfield. Thank, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, so uh, j just in terms of going back to the library, um, uh, I, I understand uh, uh, or I'm aware that we do have a click and collect service for um, um, Lynn for the um, for the unvaccinated, and and I'm just actually just interested to know uh, has 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 there been uh, much use of that service, uh, or you know have have we have we tracked um, whether or not that service has been appealing to um, you know to to that part of our community that are, are, are somewhat disadvantaged uh, for whatever reason. Yeah, um, we we actually don't hold information on people, um, you know, so we can't tell if people are, you know, we don't hold information about whether people are vaccinated or not. So, but just, or, you know, whether they're... Um, that, that wasn't my question, Lynn. No. I'm just wondering if we're, we're monitoring activity on the click and collect function. Absolutely. And yep. it, it's, it's really grown. And it'll be really interesting when we get out of the COVID, you know, get back into the green COVID framework to see how much of that um, click and collect remains because you know the the feedback that the staff have had is that people are really enjoying that and certainly with the people that are unvaccinated and can't um, enter the building there's what the staff were doing initially we're looking at the history of the reading history of um, people and then they were um, getting the books together for them. And because some of the people that were unvaccinated um, didn't have access to the internet, so couldn't do the click and collect, you know, mahi. So they, um, you know, those, and, and they used to use the library for their internet services. So yeah. the, but the click and collect, um, you know, across all vaccinated and unvaccinated has increased quite substantially. There's a number of people that actually have decided that they don't want to be um, in a facility because they just want to keep themselves safe, particularly um, older people, it seems. But yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Sure. Uh, um, Councillor Short. No, thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, in the regulatory space, I see with consenting, well, I think we all knew that, that we were struggling with resourcing and that we've had to use a lot, had to outsource a lot of that work um, at a cost. I was just wondering if we are in a better position now, have we managed to attract some staff in the consenting space? Um, we're in the middle of completing a section 17A review. Uh, because our contract with Palmerston North City Council that provide those services for us, that's in oh, the inspections. It's building control. It was more resource consenting, I was. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, that's we've got. We haven't. Um, we haven't got any more uh, employed resources in there, but we have more uh, consultants in that space. But we are actually having a look. Um, just at the moment, about what we're going to do in that space in terms of um, that team and how we better support that team and perhaps um, arrange that team so that it's a more attractive place to come and work. I'm sure all councils across the country are in a similar position and, and it's comforting, comforting for us to know what vacancies promised North's carrying in comparison to us. 
Mm. We're doing not too badly. Both our um, young guys, Oliver and Ben, who were employed as um, planning technicians, uh, have you know gone out of that phase now and have actually become planners. So we will be going out to market for another planning technician. Right. Any more questions in regards to community facilities or regulatory? No. Right. We'll, we'll move on then to the infrastructure page. Um, I'll kick this one off too. But a question regarding water supply. I note the comment there. Um, revenue of six hundred thirty favourable to, due to capital subsidies received. So I'm presuming that that's not spent yet. Um, um, and or, or Hamish. Um, and it's, it's probably really income in advance, isn't it? So perhaps uh, our, would I be correct in, in, in saying that our income is <clears throat> um, perhaps inflated this quarter by 6.30 for, because there's no expenditure to match it yet? So a significant portion of that is Ohakia, which has already been spent. We it spend spent. it, then invoice it. So of course the expenditure sits in the capital um, statements, capital um, report and the revenue itself sits over here. Um, Hamish, do okay. we have anything that we are in that we were paid for in advance? I can't think of anything, but no, it's typically um, <clears throat> through both the DIA program and also the MFE funded Ohaki project. It's essentially milestone payments. Right. So, so the I think as Amanda outlined at the start of the presentation, the the phasing of the budgets relative to the to the money coming in is secondary to the completion of the project and then the milestone claims that come as a result. So there's potentially a slight misalignment there, but um, but certainly if I could get money in advance, I would um, on every opportunity, but the government's Good. usually pretty keen to pay for what they've got as opposed to okay. pay for it in advance, unfortunately. All right. Thank you for that. My assumption was wrong. Um, any other questions on infrastructure? Yeah, Stuart, please. Yes. Um, through the chair, uh, just given our a presentation yesterday afternoon um, by Teruru, uh, just a comment, if we could, from Hamish around his comment just then around the DIA funding um, and how that's sitting with that project. Um, and can we still take part of that or have we reallocated? At this stage, we are still working on the basis that the funding allocated to the Stanway Halkham scheme, Protozoa upgrade. Um, is proceeding. Um, obviously, there's a, a go no go point in there in terms of some of the conversations and discussions and negotiations we've had over the last six months. Plus, um, we would look to, if worse came to worse, we would look at a uh, a project change, if you like, which is a it's a formal request to reallocate funds within the DIA funding block. Um, we have. We have flagged it with the DIA representatives, and it's just a process to work our way through. But <clears throat> at this stage, we are we are doing everything we can to deliver that project, um, given it was, um, in my opinion, probably the highest priority in terms of our drinking water standard compliance um, across all of our assets. Excellent. So, Thank you. Perhaps. Um acknowledge uh, you Hamish for the line under nursery very pleasing to see uh, you seem to have sorted the uh, financial affairs out there <laughs> and uh, there's um, uh, the figures are looking much better than they were uh, thank you um, it was all, yeah it's um it's an interesting business unit and um, what's not reflected in these numbers is a significant opportunity that we actually have in that space. So um, I'm, we've got a really good team down there, and I'm looking forward to. It's a shame Councillor Quarry is not on the uh, on the Zoom, but um, I'm looking forward to the next number of years for a very successful nursery. So um, yeah. All right. So. Very good. Any other questions on infrastructure? No, but I think that was a very good point made by Hamish. It's a shame that Councillor Quarry is not on the Zoom. Uh, he might be at the next meeting. We'll wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> or Councillor Quarry will be uh, well informed uh, in these matters. Um, we, uh, Mr. So with his community involvement, uh, Councillor Marsh, I'm sure you're absolutely correct, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just in terms of the um, uh, uh, the nursery, um, I understand uh, uh, 
Um, there's quite a bit of work being done in, in um, growing difficult stuff for the uh, Hamatangi um, um, erosion project. Uh, yep. Wondering if there's any, um, you know, just a little bit of an update or progress on uh, on the wetland uh, and and what sort of forward planning uh, for growth of different plants is uh, required for that. Yep. Uh, so thank you, uh, Councillor Hayfield. So the the types of plants that go into the wetlands uh, range from grasses through to what the team call re revegetation plants and then through to some of the more um, larger established sort of plants around the edges in terms of the trees and that. We, we've been working with a guy from Tonkin and Taylor, which, was, which is an engineering consultancy firm on recommendation from the regional council. Um, they are also working closely with the Tararua district council in terms of three wetland systems over there, which they're looking at putting in for their wastewater management across their small towns. So coordinating through that sort of common point, uh, we're actually growing, we're currently growing the plants for those Tararua uh, wetlands as well, which has been coordinated. They've, they've effectively um, engaged Tonkin Taylor to, to deal with it for them in terms of Tararua's perspective. Um, and so we are growing those plants. We've got some for our nursery and, uh, sorry, some for our wetland and some for theirs. So the, the growing season, uh, sorry, the, the planting season there is sort of through till about September. So we, we've got a window which we've been lining up with a construction season um, and with the uh, council's already approved the earthworks contract. Um, and also working closely with Nadi Kofoda um, around their Jobs for Nature program, which, they, um, which they've gained some significant funding through the Department of Conservation. And so they are actively working with us at the nursery and they will be looking to plant those wetland species um, in our nursery, uh, sorry, in our wetland, having helped to grow them in the nursery. So it's, it's actually more than just a nursery project. There's actually quite a good overlap there with our relationship with Nadi Kofoda and some of their probably more social social outcomes that they're, that they're working on. And they've got a great opportunity with this Department of Conservation funding to leverage their outcomes and also ours. So we'll be looking to plant probably the next three financial years. We'll be looking to grow wetland plants for our nursery and also the um, the three the three wet sorry our wetland and the three wetlands over in Tararua. And and I guess part of the business development there is I'd be looking to continue to engage with um, the likes of the Tonkin and Taylor uh, group, um, and if they're designing wetlands for other councils around the country. Um, then we should have a good line in, in terms of future supply. Um, I would just pick up as well, it was mentioned yesterday, if, if I could, the, um, the spinifex, which was talked about in terms of gene planting. That has been a traditionally difficult plant to source, and, and it was talked about yesterday that there's a demand from us, and I know Kathy's, uh, sorry, Lynn's all over the, uh, the work that we are doing, but there's also a demand in the Horofanua district and down through Kapiti as well. Um, there's actually a significant opportunity there if we can essentially ramp up production of those. The nursery team have done quite a bit of experimental work in terms of how they can get these, these seeds germinated um, and get them growing. And, and they've had some really good success down there. So I guess part of that, that future over the next few years is, is given our capacity and what we're growing in terms of our existing market, plus the likes of the wetlands, um, if we can ramp up the spinifex production as well, we've got an existing need for our own purposes. Um, but also quite a high level of demand um, at reasonable prices too for um, for other June projects. So it's just one of the layers of, of business development that that support the nursery in its financial position. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wall, for that very comprehensive response. And, and from my perspective, I'd just say that it's very pleasing to see um, uh, a little bit of structure behind the nursery and uh, and some um, uh, some commercial reality to um, to getting a bit of a return on the substantial investment that council's made in that uh, operation. Um, and so, yeah, that's really good to know that um, um, the nursery's, you know, looking to expand its, its council customer base, not its commercial customer base, um, and uh, working with Capity as well, because because it is very interesting that uh, in terms of the West Coast, um, our coastline is actually uh, encroaching into the ocean, uh, and the Hyderabad is a very good example of actually proving that fact. Um, but as you go further down towards Kapiti, uh, and especially from uh, Raumati down to Paikokariki, the, uh, the, the, um, you know, the, where the, sea, the original seawall was built, there is actually 
uh, the opposite effect where, where erosion is more of a problem. So, you know, well done on all of that. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that progress. Thank you. And like I said, there's a really committed team down there. Um, lots of good initiatives and lots of good ideas. So it's working well. Yep. Uh, John. Can I please just echo Grant's comments? Um, Hamish, I think social impact reporting is quite difficult, but given, given the somewhat vexing nature of um, the uh, nursery commentary over the years, perhaps a little bit more of um, what might be described as a PR effort um, on the nursery would be quite useful because when you look at the comments that you've just made, it just gives that landscape and that background into what's actually being done there and particularly, again, echoing Grant's comments about the, the, the need to replace our huge forests with better planting around the coast. So thanks, that was a great background. And uh, maybe um, just pushing that information out a little bit more would be helpful. Yeah. Um, if I could, Mr Chair, just, just to comment on that further, um, I, I mentioned the with regard to Nadi Kofodder and their Jobs for Nature funding, as an offshoot to that, um, I've been in conversations with a couple of representatives there for probably the last six months around their social social outcomes they're looking to achieve. Um, they're in the process of putting together a, a social outcome focused business case, which we we internally will, will review and consider and, and I guess support. What I would look to do is actually bring that to a council workshop, um, probably two or three months down the track. Um, and just sort of, I guess, introduce and socialise the wider concept. But I think it's, it, it is a key opportunity for, for a, a, a partnership come collaborative working arrangement. Um, and they're not looking, you know, it's not a group they're looking to council to, to fund everything. They're, they're quite, quite clear in their mind that they have an opportunity with the Jobs for Nature funding to, I guess, establish themselves and get the ball rolling. Um, and they are committed from the conversations I've had as to how they can then leverage off that for a future um, financially sustainable um, initiative, but also some of the broader social outcomes. So I think in terms of our discussions we've had as, a, as an organization um, across the iwi spectrum, this is a really good opportunity, which will dovetail into part of that. So when it's advanced to a point where it's something that I can talk about um, with, with some substance, I'll bring it to council. And I think John, that's, that's probably the time once council's considered it and are comfortable with the broader approach, um, that's probably the time to start maybe publicising some of the stuff and the good work that the the council and, and local area are doing together. Yep, that's excellent. Yep. Cool. Good. Thank you. All right, any other questions, comments regarding infrastructure? No, thank you, everyone. Um, we'll move on then to the uh, page 25, um, um, support services. Um, perhaps, Amanda, I could ask, you to just comment a bit more on this page because um, there's a number of reasonably large variances there in relation to infrastructure support and um, finance and treasury particularly and also the other way in regards to corporate strategy um, eh, what these mean and, and how they come about. Yeah sure so this the support services areas is actually our people so this is where we see our vacancies this is where um, we see training costs, that kind of thing. So how this area works is um, the other parts of the report are all about the areas that we get revenue for, we rate for, we publish via annual reports, annual plans, that kind of thing. These are what we call support services. They're the back office functions. We pay the people and our teams in this area. And then usually via either timesheets or via OVT allocations, we push the costs of our people out to where they work or out to where they impact the most. Um, in infrastructure, that's predominantly done by timesheeting. So they do do timesheets every fortnight. They say what job they've worked on, where they've worked, and it push, pushes the cost and puts a transaction into, say, wastewater and puts a credit back into their team centre where we're paying them to say, this is actually where that cost belongs. And that's, that's how we do our timesheeting system. For those areas that don't do timesheets, which is predominantly the rest of the organisation, um, it's mostly infrastructure that do timesheets, but some regulatory. Um, the way that we get their costs of their salaries, training and everything like that into the areas that they work is based on overhead allocation. So when we're setting the budget, we do mostly an estimate of time, which I must say is ridiculously fraught with danger 
Because if you've never recorded your time in a timesheet and what you've done in the last couple of years, how on earth you can tell us what you're going to do for the next 12 months is often a work of art, but um, and it's something we challenge a lot. So, but some of the areas are easy. So you can say um, regulatory admin, well, they work in regulatory. So really their time is pushed to regulatory. Boom, that's nice and easy. When you're looking at the likes of finance, um, I've got such a vast range of roles in there. I've got the rating ladies, I've got the accounts payable ladies, I've got the accountants, and they all work in different parts of the organization. All they do work completely across the organization because the lady doing accounts are payable touches everybody's sort of budgets. So they're allocated based on number of transactions. So that's how we get the costs out. So when we're looking at um, in these areas, the revenue being generated isn't actually revenue, it is the pushing of the costs out to the areas that they work that generates a revenue back to this area. So um, that's our first starting point, the predominantly that way. When you get a variance in there, um, that is actually due to the time sheeting variance predominantly. Those people that we thought would be doing this much work over there, and when actually they're not quite doing that much work due to leave, due to vacancies, that kind of stuff. So that's how we get the revenue variance. The expenditure variance, this is the one that I think is um, the place to kind of to look at. This is predominantly um, where we have vacancies or where we have underspent within the budget. So within the community regulatory support area, you also have the administration building sitting in there. So where we haven't spent as much in there, for instance, we were um, budgeting to upgrade it, therefore there's interest costs budgeted and there's higher depreciation. We haven't had those costs, and therefore that's under budget and expenditure. Um, that's, that's the main one. So these areas at year end are budgeted to really push all of the costs that's there out to the organisation. We don't do that as the year progresses, because these would look absolutely beautiful and would all meet their budget and break even. And everyone would say, oh, they're doing really good. And then you'd look out at these other areas, such as animal control, who might have got a chunk of this overhead pushed out to them. And they'd be saying, why am I under or over? And they wouldn't actually know because it would be being pushed down from these areas. So that's why we report them separately. So in the infrastructure support area, you do have um, some vacancies in there. Um, you're a little bit behind on training, um, that kind of stuff. Community and regulatory, you've got some, um, you know, some significant vacancies in the regulatory area. That's your, that's your planners, that's your um, admin team, that's your compliance team. Every but, everyone but the building inspectors is in the um, community and regulatory area, along with um, blah, 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 community. Lynn's team, I'm trying to think who they are, I'm having a moment. Oh, parks, property, those kinds of people. So any of the vacancies we've had in there, and as you know, we've had some vacancies in there, including the GMs. Corporate and strategy, um, that's your IT department, your customer contact centre, your uh, governance team, uh, communications and strategy. Here are some vacancies in there, so they're a little bit behind in their expenditure as well. Finance and treasury, predominantly just my finance team along with the treasury function. So the treasury function is where we're managing our external debt and our internal debt. Um, we haven't drawn down as much debt as we'd expected because we haven't done the work that we expected. Therefore, I'm under budget in, in um, interest expenditure. People and culture, it's the people and culture team plus our cultural advisor. Um, they have a small vacancy in there in the cultural advisor area. So there's a little bit of a variance in there, but not, not large. And the chief executive, I think you kind of know who he is. Um, and that's, that's there. The next section down, so that's support services. It's our people. The next section down is other activities. They're just classes, other activities, because they didn't fit anywhere else in those other groupings. And I didn't see the point of having another page just for them. So district development is a, you know, it's a, it's a budget on its own. It's a big, strong budget on its own. Emergency management, I could have put that in with infrastructure because it's Hamish that manages it, but it, but it isn't an infrastructure budget. It's just that he manages it. And then the governance team, I didn't think you guys needed a whole page of your own. All right, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Casey, you got your hand up. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess through to you, Shane. Are we trying to be as, excuse me, are we trying to be as competitive as we possibly can uh, in order to retain staff? Um, I mean, it's a really interesting labour market at the moment. Are we being as, we've been practically possible as competitive as we can be to retain key staff? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think we are, you know, we recently we've come under pressure in that planning area and I know Francis and her team have done quite a bit of work. We've um, compared salaries with NZ, uh, New Zealand Planning Institute and others. So, um, you know, we, we are um, where we need to be for the council we are. You know, we're not Auckland City. Um, no, no. We, where you see, but the reality is there are agencies out there such as Kainora who are paying well above market, um, which you know, to be quite honest, we can't match it. Yeah, look, exactly. Yeah, thank you. Um, you wish it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The district development project underspend, and I'm assuming from what Amanda's just explained the underspend, um, it, so is that due to the number of vacancies that we've had there, or though it does say specific projects? Um, so the de district development people themselves sit within the community and regulatory support. So um, I understand there is a vacancy happening at the moment. So the impact of the current vacancy um, wouldn't be showing in there. The district development line that you're seeing there is the physic, is the actual project where the um, we use the consultants and do the district plan. So the the people side of it are being allocated via overheads as per budget, but the underspend of district development, I'll leave that with Lynn. Good one. You're on um, mute. Right. That's yeah. That's um, as Amanda said. I don't think I've got anything else to add to that, but that's. Um, activity that we haven't completed yet as a result of the district planning review process. And we've just, sorry, Shane. I think also it's a reflection that um, we are behind in terms of notifying the, the, the rural um, component of the plan um, due to a number of things. Um, and so that, um, that expenditure just hasn't incurred, but it, we, we will catch up with that. Sure. Okay, right. Any other questions uh, regarding that page, um, page uh, 25? Um, no, we'll, mo keep, we'll move on then. So uh, page 26 is uh, Levels of Service, the, the, the new page, that, um, or a new format that you mentioned. Any questions on that one? There's only one read. Um, and a few reads on the next one. Anybody want to question any of those? No. Right. Any other questions at all? Any part of the? Um, oh, we've got the capital spend on the uh, capital project list on page thirty-two and three. Um, I did notice. I think that the major area there where we're behind is in stormwater. Would that be correct, Hamish? Uh, yep. So we've got um, we've got one significant project in Rongatia, um, which is going to consume the bulk of that budget. We got the tender price in, and it was slightly more than this year's budget. Um, so we're looking at this year and next year's budget. So that's due to come to council for award. Um, it'll be in, in March sometime. Um, we've been negotiating with the contractor around how we could deliver the work either over two financial years or at the end of this financial year. So we'll, we'll be playing significant catch up on that that particular budget between now and the end of June. But right. it's, um, yep, it's an end. Okay, and I suppose you, the big ticket item this year was water supply. Um, you've spent oh, a bit over half of your, um, your 54% of your budget so far, but uh, you comfortable those are on track? Um, Yes, broadly. I mean, the water supply overall, um, sorry, I'm just bringing it up. Water supply overall has included the, um, the Ohakia works, but it also includes the investment in the fielding water supply. So the development of the, the existing bore site down Campbell Road, but also the, the purchase of the Root Street site for the, the new fielding bore, and then the, um, the, the boring of that, um, the digging of that bore, boring of that well. Yep. So yeah, we're progressing, progressing all of those. All right, all good. Any questions on the capital report? No. Um, Treasury report follows 
there. Any questions or comments on that one? No? All good. All right. I think we've covered that reasonably, report reasonably fully. So um, the recommendation back on page um, uh, 13, I guess. Um, would somebody like to move that? Um, Your Worship? Yes, I'm happy to move. Yeah, yeah, th thank you. And John, you seconded. Um, I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Raise your hand or say aye. Uh, against? Um, carried. Thank you. Right, we'll move on to item 7.3, Waka Kotahi Investment and Audit Report for the Maratu District. Um, Hamish, I'll pass to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've also got John Jones online, and John is going to speak to the report um, in some de in, in detail. But uh, yeah, it's, this is part of the ongoing cycle of the NZTA investment in our roading network and then the audit and review process on, on us and what we're doing and how we do it. So, John, do you want to pick it up and run through yep. the report? Good morning, Chair, Councillors. Um, so, Waka Kotahi carried out a procedural audit in October last year, and then we finally got the results of that um, audit. It, was, it looked at the three years, 2018 to 21, and covered some $45 million worth of transactions. So out of all that, they come up with some things that they found, um, and I'll go through those. So at the end of the 2018-21, they close off that period in where we do the claim, and they have an unrealistic deadline so we overclaimed by, I think it was 30 grand, which we drew to their attention. So their recommendation was um, be more careful in future. So we said, yes, we will. <clears throat> uh, the second one, uh, that, I missed one. The first one was um, document the claims process so that if somebody gets run over by a bus, that we have a process. So we've done that, um, validate the claims, we, we will. Um, carry out a full retention, a full reconciliation of the retention account, we've done that. Um, they come up with this one, this was an interesting one. Um, we have, for the past six years, always done um, our advertising on Tenderlink, and they said that we have to do it on the government electronic tender service gets as well. So fine, we do that from now on. Um, so publish the current procurement strategy on council's website. At the, as part of their preparation before the audit, they went on our website and couldn't find it. It was there. so. Um, they just couldn't find it, so it, it is. So that's complete. <clears throat> um, apply a consistent late tenders policy to its request proposal documents. We didn't have that clause, but um, we've put one in going forward. So it's to the effect that if there is a late tender, council um, reserves the right at its discretion to accept or not. Um, some words about extenuating circumstances, which we took directly from a Waka Kotahi contract performer. So that's been done. Um, oh, this was good. Um, they went through all the tenders. In our contract documents, we say who the tender evaluation team is. And on one occasion, when it came to evaluating the contract, one person was ill. So it wasn't the same team that evaluated the contract. So they said that should be communicated to tenders through a notice of tenders. Well, it was after the fact, so we couldn't do that. So alternatively, we removed the clause that said, names the tender evaluation team. So if they're not named, um, there is no problem. 
So we've done that. Um, and this is the one that they were really concerned about. And this was, we do safety audits. Um, we did safety audits on the Awahuri fielding, safety improvements on the Rongatia right turn bay. So we did it all in accordance with their requirements. And we had a safety audit and we completed the recommendations. But the only thing we didn't do was to go back to the safety audit document and record that the recommendations have been complete. So we've retrospectively gone to those two safety audits and done the necessary documentation. Um, and that's all they found. Good. So you're comfortable um, we're all tickety-boo. <laughs> I think so, but it's they every three years they come with a different flavor. It's it depends what they're honing in on. So yeah, well, my my history of working with auditors, no matter what field of audit is, uh, the role of an auditor is to always find something. Yes, so they did struggle, um, but I think the one about the safety audits that's valid, particularly the current. Um, Waka Kotahi is focusing on road safety. So that was why it was like, what did they refer to it as? Um, significant, was it significant or? Yeah, significant improvement needed, John. Yes. That's it, yes. So we just need to complete the paperwork. That was my fault. I. All good. All right, any, any questions? In John? Malay. John. Don't so I, I just just a comment more than a question. I think when I read through this, I thought um, it was all procedural and, and probably just ticking boxes, to be honest. But then when I got to the urgent ad addressing of road safety recommendations, I thought there might be something behind that that really did need some urgent action. And yet that was simply procedural as well. Is that? Yes, it was. Uh, we carried out the actions um, that were recommended in the safety audit. But there is a, a table beneath that where we're supposed to sign off and say these have been completed. Right. And um, in the hurly burly of the business, we hadn't gone back and signed that bit off. Right. I and mean, I think if I could, Mr. Chair, it's, it's relevant to note that we regularly use an independent external um, in terms of that post construction review. So you've got another layer of, of professional eyes upon things. So right. very much a documentation thing than an actual road safety uh, concern, if you like. Sure. Okay. Um, your Worship then, Councillor Hadfield. Thank you. Um, I guess given your explanation, John, also under financial processes, it says some improvement needed in reading that. Um, that's just a procedural thing about where stuff's coded. Maybe that's for Amanda. Is, no, was, is that just, a yeah. problem or not? No, it was, as I said, they had an um, unrealistic deadline to close everything off at the end of the three-year block. So this was June 2021. Um, so we put the claim in and we'd overclaim. And then... By the time we noticed it, they closed the door on it, but we drew that attention to it. So we knew that it was just a timing thing. So that's all it was. Great. Thank you. Um, you Councillor Hebfield. Yeah, just a comment, uh, actually. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank, thank you, John, for that uh, very erudite uh, explanation uh, of, of those uh, issues. Um, all I can say uh, following your explanations is that it's restored my faith in the uh, efficiency of government bureaucracy. Uh, yes. uh, th thanks very much for your explanations. Up and well. <laughs> right. right, very good. Any other questions on the report? If not, uh, there'll be a recommendation on page 45. Um, somebody like to move that, please. I'm happy to move it as soon as I find it, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Hadfield. Um, Bear with me. It, it says the audit risk committee receives uh, it. Well, yeah, where you go. 
The, the, the Order and Risk Committee receives the Waka Katahi Investment and Audit Report and notes that the recommendations and implementation dates. Thank you. And seconded by uh, who wish it the Mayor. I'll put that um, motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Uh, carried. Thank you. And thank you, John. And thank you, Hamish, for your uh, work in, in that area, uh, filling out the paperwork. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, John, John, John does a good job there and he's well supported by a good team. So um, in a good space in the writing area. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Item 7.4, rates uh, setting process controls. Uh, Pass to Amanda. Uh, you need to unmute. Jeez. Got it. Okay. So this report is coming to you um, as a request previously to give you some um, comfort around the fact that we have done something around our screw up um, in the rate setting process that happened in this financial year. Um, so this was actually a really good process to undertake where we actually sat down and worked out what everyone was doing and chucked in the, um, chucked in the steps to sort of mitigate the risk. Um, what it did highlight within the financial, or within the accounting team is is the um, divisions of duty and that people did, really didn't have the knowledge of how their part fitted into the bigger picture. So that, that was a really good learning um, and some upskilling has occurred in there. So um, as you know, um, in this financial year of 21-22, the rate setting process um, was incorrect and in that we were overrating by a um, by value. Um, we went through the process of resetting it and reissuing the invoices. Um, and that undertook legal review and is set out in the section in the Local Government Act. So kind of, I think, you know, that's, everyone kind of understands that process. Um, because of that, we have now sat down and documented um, what to do next. And so I'm going to skip straight to the kind of the, the actual um, attachment, I suppose it's called, um, and sort of just quickly step you through that process. Okay. So the, the rates is a multi-step multi multi step process, um, obviously stemming from your budget. So once your budget has been formed and you know, you're quite aware of how we go through that process, we, we, um, we look at it, we come back to you, we um, listen to submissions, we try and fit them in, we do all that kind of stuff. And each individual rate is um, set based on your revenue and financing policy. So um, you have a proportion user fees, proportion of rates, and then the rate itself is dictated based on your revenue and financing policy. So all of that is, um, you know, quite well laid out, really. Then we, at the end of that budgeting process, where we say how much is the rates that we require to run the organisation, and how much is it by each rate, so library, Makino, regulatory rates, we then say, okay, so of that rate um, for the library, we have X amount of rating units. How much is the fee going to be for, for that year? In essence, that's what we're trying to work out. So I've called it, I think, through here, the unit price, in essence, or the, the rating price or rating value. to try to sort of differentiate what it is we're trying to calculate. We're trying to calculate that price to make sure that we've got it right. Um, so the first step that we do is we take the rates model, and um, which is the rates model we use each year, and we roll it over. Um, and we update it with the latest information from the rating database. So we bring in the, rate, the latest um, numbers of properties um, at that point in time. So notice chain, um, notice of the subdivisions, the amalgamations, that kind of thing, the latest numbers that we have. Generally, that is around January-ish, and of course we're gonna strike in July. So generally we're taking um, information that is around seven months away from the numbers we're actually going to strike. Um, in, which is why in our budget process, we always have the assumption around growth. But the very first thing we do is we take the model and we take the exact numbers out of the rating system, don't touch them at all, just say, if we were going to rate these people right now for this amount of rate, what's the rate going to look like? Because that's the cleanest way. So we run the model, we refresh all the formulas, we recheck um, the sample rate payers, that's a, that's a a part within the Excel model that says this property has this capital value or these number of SUIPs, and therefore what would their rates look like? So it gives us a snapshot to look at for reasonableness. Once I've got those prices, which is predominantly done by me to start with, um, we then pass it over to the rates, the senior rates officer, 
who physically takes that model and puts it into the rating system. She puts it into the test system because we wouldn't put in a live system. She takes an exact copy of the live into test and she runs it. And then we compare that back and say, does doing that in the rating system give us the number of the value, total value of rate that we're expecting? Um, and if it doesn't, why on earth not? Because we're using the same numbers of properties and we're using the same amount of revenue. So that's, that's one of the very first checks is if we struck it right now using these properties, would we get the right numbers? So that's the very first step. And sometimes um, we don't get, we also match that back to the sample rate payers. Sometimes that's not that accurate and it's because something has happened in the sample rate payers that I didn't realize when I was doing the model, such as their emissions may have dropped off now because they're not eligible, that kind of thing. So we go through and we analyze why are those not exactly within a few cents or a dollar of what we expected. And so there's tweaking back and forward. That process is making sure that the rates model itself that is calculating the price is accurate and then producing the output that we want. Once the model we know is working well, we then take that again, and then we apply the inflation assumptions. So as soon as you apply the inflation assumption and you put that back through the rating system, there's gonna be a variance because the inflation assumption assumes, um, say five months worth of um, inflation. So we're gonna have, say another 100 properties, but the rating system itself doesn't have those 100 properties yet. So that's where we have the, we need to check the model works first, and then we put in the inflation um, inflated numbers. So we run the model again with the inflation to get the unit price. We put that back into the um, rating system itself to check, and it should come out to be close, and the variance that we analyze will be the variance of the inflation assumption. Once we're happy that that has worked well, we actually have a rates value. So at that stage, it gets checked by various people, a minimum of three now, to check that the amount that is being um, calculated matches our funding impact statement and matches our rates requirement. At that stage, we then start formatting, formatting the um, actual budget itself. So what is published, the book, the rates resolution, that kind of thing. And those things now go off to legal review. Legal review has often been done in the past only at the LTP step. In, some, in the last LTP, we didn't actually do that. So we're proposing going forward to do that legal review for the next two years at least, um, just to be sure that we're really comfortable that if we're getting it right. Um, to be fair, we do it this year, we'll do it next year, and we do it again in the LTP. So we'll probably be doing it three years in a row, to be fair. Um, if it is an LTP year, or if we we're doing an amended LTP, audit then do an audit over that. And as we know, that has not been foolproof. Um, I would say now that they have some rather strong documented processes around that and probably a big black mark saying check this well in the audit notes because I don't think that they will be very happy that they also missed the error. Um, so at that stage we have potentially had it audited but we have run it, we've checked it through a test system, through um, another test system, had it signed off, we've done the rates resolution, we've legal reviewed it so we're pretty happy at that stage. It's right, it's gone to be published and you have your annual plan or LTP that goes through and gets adopted by council. Um, and then the actual process of striking the rates, which is sending out the invoices happens in July. And there's a range of checking against that again, which is take the prices, put it through the model. And um, there's some checks in there to make sure that the prices input into the model match back. That's another bunch of checking that gets done and then the strike itself. So I kind of feel like I've talked lots. Um, you've got it all documented there. I did think about putting it yep. into a flow diagram, but I didn't. So no, um, all good. You've got uh, full full notes there. So um, we'll just open for questions. Um, I guess we should note. Um, yeah, Aralyn, I understood that last year you were some of your formulas and calculations are predominantly spreadsheet based is that, is that is that part of the issue um yeah there's the portion that's spreadsheet based is the actual calculation of the rate value itself the individual rate price is spreadsheet based um you can put that you can buy various systems that do that and when we upgrade upgrade the um erp which is ozone which is our core finance 
regulatory and a whole lot of CRM. It's our, sort of our core system of council. There are now systems out there that are, that are good at doing this kind of thing. Um, so it's definitely would be in the equation of what we do going forward. Um, canvassing other councils, predominantly um, the rates are set in spreadsheets, actually. Um, oh. The exception of that is Horizons, but their rates are ridiculously complex. Ours, are, ours actually aren't that complex when it comes to calculating. Um, theirs are ridiculously complex. So they do have a, a system, but it is only as good as the person um, that sets it up and yeah. the person setting it up needs to understand the formulas and be ready to change at the drop of a hat should council want to change something. Yeah. I guess the primary source where we identified the uh, error was um, uh, from uh, a number of rate pairs who had extraordinary um, increases. So, yeah, and I note you've included that in your in your document to to check those out. Um, so, yeah, I think it's probably quite an important step um, if there are um, any individual rate pairs with with you know more than two or three times the um, expected rate rise that they should be investigated. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one of the really important checks that we've built in there is we should be able to look through the list to see those strange variances and be able to work out why it is. Yep. And it could be change in value, um, rezoning. It's another yes. thing that have been rezoned, subdivided, changed in value, built something on. Yep. And if it's not, then what the hell is happening? Is yep. But obviously if we get a whole block of rate pairs, um, you know, with, with big gains, then it could well be something wrong. So, yep, I'm good you've noted that. Right. So uh, hopefully you're reasonably comfortable that um, that will provide some checks and uh, errors. Any uh, any questions on the on that paper? No. All good. Well, um, we'll have a what have we got for a recommendation on page um, page fifty nine? Uh, perhaps yeah, we'll better have a motion to move. Um, uh, the recommendation there on page 59. Councillor Casey. Yeah, happy to move that, Mr. Chair. Would you like it read out? Um, no. Um, everyone can read that. Uh, a seconder, please. Happy to second. Uh, thank you, Councillor Marsh. I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Right. Any, any against? If not, carried. Very good. Right. Thank you for that, uh, Amanda. Right. Uh, moving on. Um, item eight, update and internal audit. Who's updating that one? Amanda, you can you can chime in there. <laughs> uh, unmute again, please. <laughs> Purposely muted myself and then forgot about it. <laughs> Um, we have two internal audits on the way or happening at the moment. We have Cotton Kelly Schmidt. Um, which is our internal external auditor, you know, so we've contracted them. Um, they're an external provider by um, MWLS. They're doing the sensitive expenditure um, policy audit. They are partway through. As part of their audit, the scope was also to come back and pretty, I want another word, tell us where our sensitive expenditure policy is not meeting OAG guidelines. Um, and they've just done that, I think it was last week, where I've got to spend some time and review that. We'll take that through and have a look. And also doing some checking on our actual transactions to check that we are behaving as we're supposed to, using the appropriate checks. So, so that is um, in, a, in the big picture, a reasonably cheap audit. I think it's between two and 5,000, which for an audit is actually pretty cheap. So that's happening. Then we have the Meaty Grunty um, GST FBT audit, which has been done by Deloitte's. Um, and they were supposed to start this week, but just with the delays in the annual report in, in the backlog of work in my team, I've just pushed them out a couple of weeks because we need to do some significant amount internally to, um, to complete a questionnaire and, a, and get a whole lot of source information. So that's the next focus. Once we've got a bit of work out the way is the GST FBT audit. Um, and those are the only two things currently committed, although we do have the regular annual um, IT audit that happens. We, we have kind of like hackers trying to break the system, that kind of stuff. That regular kind of work is still happening. Um, but from our audit program, 
We haven't yet put anything else on the schedules because we're really waiting for that report from, um, from Clint to come through. He did highlight in his report to council um, a couple of things, which right now off the top of my head I can't remember, but I remember thinking that would probably pop up onto our next um, internal audit requirements. So once we get that audit report from him, I think that'll give us a bit more of a steer. Thank you. All good. Any questions on the uh, internal audit program? No, well, thank you for that update. Right. Uh, item nine is an update from the Governance Health and Safety Representative. Um, Councillor Marsh, you got anything to update us on? Um, no, nothing really. Um, Francis would have highlighted that this morning in the initial conversations I think you all had. Um, and uh, just with the coverage of the um, split within the teams around the, um, around the council workers, um, nothing really. We've got another meeting on the 23rd. So uh, yeah, it's, it's running pretty well. Brooke and, Brooke and Francis are right on top of it. It's going really well. Okay, thank you for that. Item 10 is uh, consideration of late items. There are none. Item 11, notification of items for risk register. Um, just a few things that I noted during the meeting today that uh, we need to check uh, on the risk register. Um, obviously, number one being COVID, the risk of staff being unable to work, um, disruption, loss of productivity and, and customer service. Um, so perhaps, Steph, you could just make a note and follow up that those items are on the, on the register. Um, I guess there's also that risk of staffing, which I understand is there, um, inability to track staff, particularly in the building and planning, um, building consenting and planning areas. And um, perhaps we should include um, the risk of uh, NZTA audit failure. <laughs> I guess it's a risk. Um, we're comfortable that's uh, a low risk based on the work that's been done, but it's still a risk. Any other risks that um, anybody's picked up that they, they think should be on the register or, uh, should, or should be checked at? Um... Uh, yes, Stuart, if I may, just, I made the comment yesterday afternoon around um, um, the cancellations of a few events at Manfield. Um, now I know it doesn't sit under us as such. Um, having said that, as part of the settler, um, I think there is an opportunity there to just um, uh, keep our eye on that. I had a chat um, post our meeting yesterday with Hamish um, and uh, it was great to see that they've taken some mitigating ex um, actions around some of that and made those dates available for other activities. Um, but it might be just something to, to put there just to um, keep, our, keep our head around. Yeah, oh, look, I think that's a valid point because... Um... Uh, is one of three set laws to Manfield. Uh, I guess council's going to be the um, last board of call or, or, the, or, the, or the final underwriter, if you like, of anything that may happen uh, if, if things did go bad there. So, um, yeah, valid point, I think. Any other items or? No, all good, thank you. Um, item 12, notification of items for next meeting. Um, is there any items that any member of the committee would like to see on the next agenda? Or um, perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Harris or, or any other members of the team would like to highlight any other items they're planning to bring forward to this uh, to the next meeting? Um, the, only, the only one will be if we receive the end year audit management report. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, we're just waiting on audit to deliver that so um, if that gets to us in the next week while we'll put it on the agenda all good thank you um just a question too probably shane um we should hear something from our um from the government around the three waters reforms and sort of the where to next within the next month or two or three hmm. I guess it's just an open question if that's relevant for an audit and risk discussion or that's possibly more a wider council discussion. Could well be. So we'll just uh, wait until that announcement comes out, I guess, and, and, and if required, we can uh, put it on the agenda for this committee. All good. Right, no other items. Um, 
Okay, well, that brings us to item 11, um, meeting closure. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance today and, and your contribution. And um, we'll note the next meeting, which will be in uh, May. I'm sorry, I haven't got the date in front of me, but um, we'll see you then. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. See you, everybody. Thank you.